Okay. I don't know if, if how long it takes until everybody is in. You think it's okay now? Yeah, I think it's good. Okay, so let's start with our um, invited plenary session. Um, today's speaker will be Ronnie Serka. Um, he's a professor in operations research and financial engineering at Princeton University. He's the chair of that department and also affiliated with the Bentheim Center for Finance and the Antlinger Center for Energy and Environment. Um, yeah, he's well known uh, for his work in financial mathematics, stochastic volatility models, energy markets, um, credit risk, and yeah, portfolio optimization, stochastic control problems, and stochastic differential games. And today's talk will be on computational challenges and game theoretic models for energy production and cryptocurrency mining. Um, if there are questions from your side during the talk, um, please press this Q&A button that you see below there and type in your questions. And then we will have maybe in between, but also at the end of the talk, um, I will then read out um, your questions and Ronnie can answer them. Um, there's also um, a chat function that you can use. Um, okay, well, this is from my side. So welcome, Ronnie, and um, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Birgit, for the introduction, and thank you especially for doing this, what must be very late uh, okay. in Vienna on a Friday evening. And thank you for everyone for coming at this time also. Um, so I'm going to, um, let me share a screen and hope this works. Uh, One second. Okay, hopefully that will work. I had some trouble with it before. Um, no, it's not got my annotate. Just a second. Okay, so um, I want to uh, talk about some uh, work involving game theoretic models, in particular, uh, this being a SIAM conference, to talk a little bit about the computation involved and um, you know, various things that we found that have worked and have not worked in the context of these problems. Uh, the motivation for these problems will be from uh, models of energy production that uh, I've been involved with for a number of years. And um, apologies to some of you will have heard some parts of the first part of the talk, but I wanted to sort of do it from scratch. Um, for a general SIAM audience. And then also to talk about a recent application to understanding cryptocurrencies uh, such as Bitcoin. So let me just sort of dive in and uh, make this the starting point that um, we are interested in markets where there is there are a few N, let's say, uh, influential players. That N could be a handful, it could be a hundred, it could be a few thousand. Um, but in general, these are influential producers, and this kind of a market is called an oligopoly. And they are not cooperative, they're in fact competitive. Um, and as such, they are, um, uh, they are, there needs to be a mechanism to, to quantify their competition, and game theory Nash equilibrium provides one way or a natural way in many senses uh, to frame the outcome of this competition. And so I'm going to take a starting point for the type of models that I'm interested in, the work of Cournot, which goes back to 1838. Um, and um, he, uh, you know, introduced what was what we now call a Nash equilibrium um, more than 100 years ago, 100 years before Nash, but in the context of a particular model, rather, in, rather than in the generality that Nash did it. Um, and so his work in 1838, he was interested in producers of um, a natural good mineral water. And he proposed a model in which uh, the producers chose how much water to bring to market. So their control variable, their choice variable was quantity. And I'll argue for oil production, for instance, other energy, um, this kind of corner competition is the natural way to um, frame the problem. And then there is another type of competition I just mentioned for historical reasons, Bertrand, uh, 1883, uh, who wrote uh, this, this 1883. So the 1838 book, uh, work of Cournot is a book this 1883 uh, work of Bertrand is not a paper or a book, it's a book review of Cournot's book in which he uh, you know, scathingly criticized Cournot for saying that's ridiculous. Uh, firms don't set quantities, they set prices. And so games in which you set prices are now called Bertrand uh, 
uh, Bertrand markets or Bertrand competitions. Now, people looked into the history of this much later and they found that, well, actually Bertrand probably didn't read all of Cournot's book when he reviewed it and what he did read, he probably didn't understand that well uh, because Cournot in his book has also games of price setting. So if things were just, if this were a just world, then we would call these these days Cournot markets of quantity and Cournot markets of price. But the Bertrand, it's too late now, Bertrand is associated to this price setting. But in our case, we're interested in what is classically called Cournot, which is quantity setting games. So when these become dynamic, perhaps stochastic in continuous time, uh, they are, in the finite player case, they're sort of notoriously um, difficult to solve numerically. When I say solve, I mean numerically. Um, and in the games that we're interested in, there are features that are, uh, you know, distinguish the players from each other. They are, uh, you know, they may have different oil reserves. They may have other different features. Um, so it's not, a, it's not a kind of a symmetric game where everyone is essentially the same. Um, and also another feature of these things is that uh, these oil producers go out of business. You see that a lot now going on with the fracking industry. And so the number of active players may change. And these are two of many important features um, to try and capture in these kind of models. And what I want to highlight today is, uh, is continuum uh, mean field game, approximate, continuing mean field game versions of these problems, which I view as one way uh, to construct numerical approximations to these things. So as a motivation, let me, uh, you know, put here a graph of uh, US, uh, Texas oil prices over roughly uh, the last 10 years up until yesterday. Um, and uh, you see here, you know, in the early 2010s, um, when we were coming out of the financial crisis, um, and commodities prices were high, oil was, in this, this oil measure, uh, the WTI was up above $110 a barrel. And then you see this precipitous crash in June of 2014, um, which you can view as a motivation for some of these, uh, of, this, of this sort of game theoretic model. And the reason for this is that around that time, fracking came online in the United States. The United States became a much bigger producer of oil and they were pumping out, they were increasing the quantity, their supply, of oil, and it was, as a result, the global oil prices um, collapsed uh, due to the increase in supply. So that's a motivation that what is happening to a large extent in these markets is that quantity is dictating price, the Cournot type way of uh, looking at this thing. And then later on, you know, in the period since 2014 up until earlier this year, you see there are uh, temporary rallies, uh, largely due to OPEC uh, cutting production to increase the price in the uh, early part of this year, four months ago, you see the uh, COVID lockdown related uh, crash and what has rallied in recent weeks is also partly due to OPEC's decision to cut supply and other producers' uh, decisions to do the same thing. So this is just to quantify the relationship between, um, between production and price. And so here in a nutshell is kind of the simplest formulation of both Cournot and Bertrand, but we'll focus on Cournot. So there are, let's say in the simplest static case, there are N um, producers of, uh, of oil, let's say, and they have a profit, player I has a profit uh, pi I, which is the amount that he or she produces, QI multiplied by the price minus their cost. And these may be individual prices and these may be individual costs in this generality. Um, so Bertrand, as I mentioned, here, the PI would be the control variable, and the model would be to give you a function DI, which tells you if the players choose the vector of prices P, how much demand each, um, how much demand each um, person would get. And so that's uh, the Bertrand version of this model, which we're not interested in, but Kuno is that QI is the control variable, and the model is a function, let's say capital PI, which given the production decisions of all the players gives you the price they will receive for their good, which will be different for each, each player uh, in general, uh, little pi. And so this, the typical model, or one that I'll use largely for the illustrations, is essentially this has to be a decreasing function of the queues. So the queues are the quantity, and the price the player I gets is one minus the quantity he produces minus some parameter epsilon times, let's say, the average uh, of the quantities produced by all the other players. So Q sub I bar is the average of all the other players' quantities excluding player I. Okay, and here also you see in this sum, you see a notion of the mean field already coming into the Cornell model um, long before people were um, interested in mean field versions of it. 
So I've mentioned already that it, when, if you take this to continuous time, you, you stick with the end player game, then uh, you get a system of nonlinear Hamilton Jacobi Bellman equations, um, which in the Kuno case was studied in this paper with Harrison and Harris, and in the Bertrand case with Ledvina some years ago. And about that time, I personally gave up any hope of having a robust numerical solution to these equations. In special cases, you can do it. Um, but um, the nonlinearity was such that it conspired against everything that we and various other people were trying to, uh, to work with. Around the same time, this theory and practice of mean field games became uh, popular. Um, and, you know, to put it, you know, in a succinct fashion, if you're dealing with the n player stochastic differential game, you're trying to solve a system of n nonlinear PDEs in n dimensions. Um, and in the mean field approximation, one way to think of it is that there are two equations, um, complicated equations, but at least numerically, you're dealing with these two equations. And so there have been many talks in uh, this conference this week and last week on, on, on mean field games. Uh, you know, it, it goes back to these papers of Lashley Lyons and Huang Malame Kames uh, about 15 years ago, and there are a number of books on it. Uh, Benson saw Frey's uh, Yam, uh, the, the, this uh, book of Carmona de la Rue, um, and, um, um, and, and like Bertrand, I must admit, I have not read all every page of one of these books, which is rather large, uh, but I intend to. Um, and uh, so I'm going to carry on now with, with Cournot competition. And there is a result that you can show that in the continuum limit, it doesn't matter whether you set it up as Bertrand or Cournot, um, the equilibrium is, uh, is the same. So uh, now I need to go on here. Uh, so here is the here is the setting um, here is the setting of the basic Cournot exhaustible resources problem. So it starts with a continuum of producers. So I should have had a picture here, but imagine a, a density on the positive half line. X here is how much oil each player has, and this capital M is a density function, uh, which describes, for example, that uh, there may be a lot of players with a, a few players with a lot of oil, a few players with a little bit of oil, and a bunch of players in the middle with a medium amount of oil at time t is equal to zero. So that we assume that we can observe how much oil a bunch of major players have, how much their reserves are. So this distinguishes bigger and smaller players by their initial condition. And then this density will evolve because players are extracting their oil. And so the density is, is if there's no stochasticity, it's moving to the left. Um, as players uh, use up their reserves. So we denote by little m of t and x, the density of firms with positive reserves at time t. So this density moves to the left. Um, and moreover, people will get to zero and they will, in some sense, disappear from validity in these type of models. So there is a dynamic equation. So let's say, let's deal with a, um, a stochastic case. So x at capital T is, sorry, x at little t is how much oil a generic player uh, has at time t. And the evolution of this x for this generic player is that it decreases at uh, the extraction rate q, the, the, the control, the quantity rate uh, that he or she chooses. And you could choose to um, add a, a stochastic term sigma dw, w is a Brownian motion. And I'll come back to kind of other notions of stochasticity in these problems um, a little bit later. Okay, and the key feature is that this x is absorbed at zero, so players run out, and this density accumulates uh, at, uh, at x is equal to zero. So what is the objective function of these oil producers, let's say? So the firm who starts at some point x, x is the amount of reserves at time t is equal to zero, maximizes, uh, you know, he, he chooses, sorry, it's just that quantities, not prices, sets quantities q to maximize uh, his or her lifetime discounted profits in the simplest version of this problem. So starting at time little t, uh, they will maximize the expected revenue. The revenue is price times quantity. Price is the model which is contained in this uh, equation here. Um, Q is the control variable. This is discounted to give us a chance of having a finite solution at some discount rate r, the same for all of the players for simplicity. Uh, Q is the extraction rate that he's maximizing over. He, he extracts uh, as long as he or she has reserves left. So this is the indicator function here. And then this is for dynamic programming purposes. This is set up as a value function, U of T and X, conditioned uh, on starting with little x reserves of oil at the starting time, little t. And then the model, the Kuno model, which gives you the relationship 
between what people produce and what price they get is for simplicity here, the one minus quantity. So one minus my quantity minus epsilon, which is some degree of interaction with the average quantity uh, produced by all of the players. And so associated to this then, there is, this is a control problem. So let's say given the Q bar, for instance, this is a control problem. If I guess the Q bar, which is sort of what you will end up doing numerically, um, then uh, there is an HAB equation associated with this. Um, and so that's written here. I won't go into the details except to say the sub problem here reveals that in this maximization problem, Q times one minus Q minus epsilon Q bar minus du dx, this is the, the static problem, if you like, with du dx, the gradient of U, uh, playing the role of cost or scarcity. So, as, so this U will be an increasing concave function. Um, and as you move closer to zero, this, this cost term du dx becomes steeper, which uh, sort of quantifies that you have a kind of a hidden cost as you start running out of oil. Okay, and so then I won't go through all of these, uh, these details, but uh, you saw, you know, there's an internal maximization problem. You solve for the control. You have to worry about it going negative, but let's brush over that. Um, then you can average this equation to integrate this with respect to M and you get a scalar equation for the Q bar. This is the, uh, the feedback mean field structure. So the Q bar, the average production is given by this equation. It's written in terms of eta t. Eta t is the fraction of players left at time t. So it's the integral, not counting the people who have gone through zero of M of t and x, not uh, from zero plus to infinity. So for t large enough, the system loses mass because the, the players who run out of their oil, they no longer have an influence on the price. It's like they didn't exist. That's one of the features um, at, of, of exhaustibility uh, that's, that's built into this thing. So then you can plug the maximum into the HAB and you get some equation like this. But the key thing is that you have, um, the key thing is that you have a, um, uh, a boundary condition at X is equal to zero. Uh, so this is, this is not on the full space, this is on the half space. And then associated to this is, and I hope you can see this, this bar here that I can see. Um, I don't know, no one can tell me, but um, the, 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 the other equation is for the density of, uh, of the capital XT. So there is a second equation, which is a forward equation. The HAB is a backward equation. There is a forward equation, um, which is, you know, again, given Q bar and given DUDX is a linear equation of uh, focal plank or comma of type and the initial condition for this thing i hope it's not covered here is um is capital m of x okay so so now there is uh two equations to solve um i want to make a comment uh that um at least in the in the literature on mean field game which is pde based uh the um, the system of equations is slightly different. There is an HAB equation, there is a Kolmogorov equation, and they're coupled uh, in this way, the square bracket means some sort of integral operator. Uh, in these oligopoly games, and I'll explain why on the next slide, uh, the coupling is, uh, is in the Hamiltonian. This is the Hamiltonian of the HAB equation. There is an integral of the M and the dvdx that it's written V here of the value function inside the Hamiltonian, and there is a coupling also in the drift term of the Kolmogorov equation. And so the, the, the reason for this, and, and this is um, slightly different from most of the PDE-based mean field game literature, at least until very recently, um, is that for us, the control is through the interaction, that's for us, the interaction between the players is through the control. So you see that the integral of the control Q with respect to M appears everywhere in uh, at least the initial mean field game models, and a lot of them, the interaction is through the state. You have the integral of X with respect to M. So that accounts largely for the difference between those two sets of equation. Um, and um, this is referred to by different things. Originally, I think it was called extended mean field games in, um, in, in papers of Gomez. Now um, it's called mean field games of control. So that is the other feature of these type of models that we're interested in, as well as, and I'll keep stressing this boundary condition at X equals zero. So at, at first pass, when you look at you know, the, the linear um, dynamics and the linear objective or the quadratic objective function, you might think that this is of a uh, linear quadratic type, um, but there isn't a linear quadratic solution because the key feature of this boundary condition um, at X is equal to zero, okay? 
uh, now under certain conditions, and people are working to improve this, including some uh, um, work I'll mention a little bit later on, um, people have been able to prove existence and uniqueness of a classical solution of this oligopoly, albeit on a finite domain in space and time. Um, so there is some theory to, um, there is some theory and there are also some asymptotic approximations to, uh, you know, go after the system numerically and see what we can get out of it. So that is the next uh, thing that I want to illustrate. Um, so I have mentioned many times and I will mention again that solving the n player system is notoriously difficult. Here, you know, there's of course difficulty inherited, which is that uh, the density function will accumulate at zero. Um, and you also may want to deal with a case where you kind of trick the system into being a finite player system um, by taking a point of uh, taking a sequence of direct masses for the initial density to, to say, hey, you know, this is one player here, this is one player here, this is one player here. And so it's one numerical thing that is useful. And this is work um, that we have with a former student, Patrick Chan, uh, is to consider instead the, uh, the tail distribution function. So eta bar of Tnx is not the density function, but the, but the integral of the density function starting at the point x. And so this will also, by integrating the m equation, um, solve a sort of forward equation uh, of this type. And then the initial condition, which would be the integral of these direct functions, if that's what you take it to be, will be, um, you know, will be a step function and that's more amenable to numerical treatment. So I'll show one example where we have um, direct masses as the initial condition and um, that is, um, uh, you know, that works quite well, at least in our experience. Okay, so again, in all of this, um, I sort of, not providing proof of convergence, but more of a proof of concept that, you know, you have this system of equations. It is, uh, you know, the HAB is nonlinear. The other one is only linear given the solution of the first. Um, and so, you know, what is an iterative scheme um, that uh, at least for us works quite well. And, the, and what works is to make an initial guess for eta. Eta is the fraction of players uh, left at time t. So this is a function of time. Um, and for, um, P bar, so P bar is the, uh, uh, P bar, sorry, this should say Q bar. So Q bar, let's say, P bar is derived from that. Um, and then to solve uh, the HJB and the Fokker Planck equations by numerical differences, for example, um, recompute eta and P bar. And if the solution is not changing, then, then you're done. Otherwise you take your solution of your Kolmogorov equation, the M, you recompute eta by integrating it with respect to X, you recompute Q bar, by integrating the optimal control with respect to the M and you go back around. And so at least um, for values of the uh, interaction parameter epsilon um, small enough, uh, then this uh, has uh, worked well uh, in, in the examples that we have tried with randomness, without randomness. Um, and so, um, uh, so that's, that's one thing I want to report on. Um, and um, yeah, so let me show some, some pictures uh, going, going forward. Uh, so here, without getting into the details of the parameters and all this, you know, maybe, so this is an output of the um, numerical solution for epsilon equals zero and with no randomness, there's an explicit solution with epsilon here showing 0.3, this is the, the purple one. Then uh, let's say for example, uh, you know, this is the average price on the top left curve. So this is relatively smooth um, and, uh, you know, at least for a reasonable amount of time. This is e to of t, the fraction of players that are left. So by time five, everybody has run out of oil. And you can see that compared to when there is no competition, epsilon is equal to zero and epsilon is equal to 0.3, the game sort of lasts longer because people conserve their resources in the frame of competition, in the presence of competition. And this is something that uh, can be uh, you know, quantified if we have good estimates of the parameters here. And these are the trajectories of the game. So it's a deterministic game. I think we took the sigma equals zero here and you can see for various initial starting points, how the game produces uh, to zero for the, for the person starting at that value of, uh, of X. So this is to illustrate that this worked quite well. The next picture illustrates the Dirac uh, situation. So here, this is taking an initial density which, in which you have 10 players at, um, at specific points. Um, and 
and you see that the p-bar here is the average price, the price is essentially going up, except when there's a market structure, this is when one of those 10 players disappears off the edge of the thing. So again, the numerics works quite well, and this captures uh, sort of a discrete uh, phenomenon in a continuum setting. Okay, so um, that's the, uh, you know, that, that's the, um, the basic game. And then I want to address both through this and the cryptocurrency model, uh, something about you know what the randomness is or what, what some of the central randomnesses or uncertainties are in this problem. So so far, you know, in some sense, just out of routine, we've just added Brownian fluctuations. But a lot of the issues in oil are about new discoveries. And so uh, I want to speak briefly, and it will segue into the cryptocurrency type model uh, about models where you where you incorporate exploration and random discoveries. Um, and uh, so this is, uh, you know, this was done, uh, you know, in the, in a lot of the literature was in the 80s um, when um, uh, there were a lot of new discoveries of oil um, and they were done in the, in the monopoly context in a bunch of papers in the 80s listed here, 80s and 90s. And um, with Michael Kowski, we had a paper doing it as a game. And here I want to just talk about the mean field game version of uh, this problem. And so essentially it's like before you have the reserves, you're choosing the control Q at which you deplete your reserves. Um, and there is a controlled discovery process. So this NT is a counting process. It has a stochastic intensity, forget the lambda, but let's say A of T, uh, and you choose the A of T. And the idea is that when you're running out of oil, you're spending a lot of money, A T, or you're putting in a lot of effort, exploring, sending out, uh, you know, sending out vessels to look for new oil. Um, and of course that has a cost to doing that, which is some convex cost function, capital C, um, so that you, you, you're paying for, for all this discovery. And this can also be thought of as models for research and development. So in the early eighties, um, that's when people started working on this fracking technology, which, which kind of came online 30 years later because oil was uh, in bad shape in the seventies. Um, and so in this model, without getting into the details, every time there's a discovery, there's a fixed increase in reserves. So this DN is positive, that the N is increasing, um, and it increases the reserves by a parameter delta. Now there is a value function, which is, again, maximizing an expectation, but there are two controls, the, the usual one over the quantity and the one over the exploration effort. And, um, and so there is an AJB equation, as before, um, added to a, uh, a, a, an optimization problem where you choose the amount uh, of effort that you're going to produce, uh, you're going to, um, you're going to um, invest in exploring new oil or discovering new technologies, et cetera. So there you see that a discovery of new oil increases the value function from X to X plus Delta. So this is now an AJB equation um, with, with jumps or with a delay term. And again, um, I uh, really just here want to illustrate that, so the Kolmogorov equation also will have delay terms, which are given here. Um, and I, in the interest of time, I just think I just want to skip to the picture and show that um, the um, numerical uh, solution is, again, is, is quite tractable even with the delay. You have to make some choices how you deal with the delay term. Um, and here you see essentially that as a function of your initial condition, you know, as you're running out of oil, you, you, you lower your rate of extraction, but on the other hand, you increase your A star is the optimal effort, and these can all be quantified in terms of uh, this mean field gain. So this is the work that we had done, um, you know, up to a couple of years ago on, um, on the mean field games with, with, with random jumps. And uh, I'll skip this picture. Um, yeah, I think I will also skip this. So uh, I'm, this is going faster than I thought. Um, so let me make one comment on the, um, on the analysis of this thing. So the first set of equations that one has here, these are the, um, the N player game equation. So uh, you will have a term from the randomness you'll have some function which comes from that quadratic that you're trying to maximize, or this is written in general, which depends on, so this is the N equations for the N value function. So this depends, this is the shadow cost, the derivative of my value function with respect to my state. 
And then you will have terms which, which interact, uh, which tell you how the other players interact, uh, affect me. So this is the derivative of me with respect to the, the amount of oil that another player has. This is a so-called externality term and then a term from discounting. And these are interactive, the, you know, the interaction here is, this is what I was calling the little Q bar before, it's now, it's now big Q bar. Now, the mean for game version of this is, is written here. So just in the similar notation as above, here the, you, know, you have a single value function. So the dvi dxi becomes a dv dx. And the externality term somehow is contained in this definition of this q bar star, which is the integral of the little q with respect to m. But then you have to carry an equation uh, for the evolution of the m. So this is just saying, you know, the original n plus stochastic differential game, the mean field game, the continuum mean field game version of it. And then more recently, people are interested in the so-called master equation version of this. That one way, uh, you know, to, one can think about it is that, you know, one has the value function and the Kolmogorov equation here. And are these characteristic equations uh, of a equation on a bigger space? Um, and so what I've written here is for this kind of oligopoly game, this, this game, mean field game of control, this is what we think following a recipe of, you know, if this is this, this is this, what the, what the master equation is for, um, for this, for, for our problem. And you see, of course, that you are, that what is the price you pay is that you, you have one equation, but the U is a function of the X and of the function of the density. So the M, so all these, functional derivatives have to be defined in the right space, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but this, at least uh, heuristically, based on this book of Cadaglier et al, uh, is what we think the equation is of interest. And then we're working to make this all rigorous with Jameson Graeber. And, and, and I will stress again, the difficulties that we have is that all these equations are posed on half space with the boundary condition at x equals zero. So finding the right space and the right notion of derivative is where, uh, you know, it's, it's very, it's extremely technical, but I think it's of interest um, mathematically. Okay, so then uh, finally, I want to talk about, I was going to stop for questions, but I think I'm going to run out of time. So let me just keep going. Um, and hopefully um, there'll be some time at the end. So Bitcoin, so Bitcoin's, um, everybody's familiar with, they're, they're a cryptocurrency created in January of 2009. And what I'm talking about now is a, is a work with former student Jean Chilly and Max Rappen, who uh, just finished as a postdoc uh, with, uh, with in Princeton. Um, and he spoke on this topic and he explained it uh, in, uh, in detail, the relationship between the Bitcoins and blockchain. Um, so if you're interested in this, I recommend you, uh, I, I would refer you to the recording of his talk yesterday. But essentially, I want to highlight this as, a, as again, a mean field games type model. So they're independent miners. So even the language is the same as, 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 as you know, people are producing something. They compete for the right to record the next transaction on the blockchain. Uh, they follow so-called proof of work protocol and they solve math problems. This is the effort. So once the miner obtains a solution, the corresponding block is added to the blockchain and a miner obtains a reward. This is a way of looking at it. And the math puzzle is a computational problem, meaning that it's designed such that you have to solve it by brute force calculation. And the chance of getting the reward is proportional to how much effort you put in. So you see the links between the mining and the exhaustible resources, and you see the link between the, um, the computational power and the uh, exploration effort that we had before, but the model will be, um, will be very different. And so this is genuinely probabilistic. This is you put in effort and you get a random reward. Um, so so, the, so, so this, this calls for having a, you know, an, um, a, re, a jump process with controlled intensity. Um, and, um, the, uh, and the difficulty of the puzzle varies to maintain sort of a consistent solving time, for example, 10 minutes. So let me put what the, what the equations are. So just as with the exploration effort, uh, there is, uh, you know, there's a continuum of minors. They start with an initial density of wealth. So this is going to be a, a wealth maximization problem. Um, and um, their rewards are modeled by this counting process, NT again, with jump intensity lambda T. And the lambda T, so there's a number of things going on in this equation. This is sort of the important equation. Uh, so alpha T is, uh, is, is an individual hash rate, how much computational effort you put into mining of these bitcoins. 
alpha bar of t is the average. That's the Q bar in the exhaustible resource system. So the alpha bar is the average of the continuum hash rates. It's the mean hash rate. And then what we think is important in this problem is to try and preserve uh, that uh, it's not really the mean, it is the aggregate. So we want to sort of trick the mean field game technology into dealing with the fact that uh, that the intensity of my reward, how lucky I'm likely to be, is proportional to my effort relative with some parameter d to not the average effort, but the total effort. So we're sort of bringing back this, so m is a parameter, it's not the density from the previous slides, m is, a, is, is the number of players, the number of people in this mining uh, business. And so this m alpha bar t is sort of trying to trick the system from going from the average, which is what the mean field game, mean field game technology needs, to the aggregate by multiplying by let's say 10,000 players or 1,000 players. So, you know, this equation, you know, this is, the, this is our model. And, um, you know, there's a couple of things going on here. I mean, you have, you know, the M is like the epsilon before. And, and so now we want, it's like asking M to be large is like asking that epsilon to be large. And, and most of the things that have worked previously have been for epsilon small enough, even the existing theories that exist are for the interaction parameter being small enough. And then moreover, this alpha divided by alpha plus alpha bar is crying out for the alpha to want to be zero. Uh, and so, you know, I must admit when, when, when Zhongxi and uh, Max wanted to do this, you know, I was very supportive. I said, yeah, sure, go ahead. It's never going to work. Um, and, uh, you know, fortunately, it, it has turned out to be quite interesting, uh, conversely, that there, are, there is interesting equilibrium and observations that come out of this, uh, of this model. And so here's the, here's the story as I'm running out of time. So again, it's, this is about each miner is a expected utility maximizer. Uh, the state variable is the wealth. So X is the wealth at time T. Uh, and there are two components. So as he, uh, you know, expends more computational power at rate, at hash rate alpha, uh, he's spending his wealth with some scaling parameter C. But every time the effort pays off, the, the jump process jumps, and he gets a reward, which is R. Uh, now, of course, what you hear about Bitcoin is about the price being crazy, and the reward, uh, so this reward is, is, is different from the price, and, and, and the notion of the craziness of the price is not contained in what we're doing here, and we can, I mean, that's addressed somewhat in the paper, but um, uh, we can talk about that another time. Um, so think of here as the R is the reward that you get when you when you you know when you when you hit the jackpot in some sense with the computational effort. And then for simplicity, let's you know to to, to quantify the risk reward structure. Um, let's suppose that the players are maximizing expected utility. This will be power utility in general uh, of of wealth at some fixed time capital T. Let's say a year into the future. And what is the uh, what is the structure of the uh, of the solution? So. Again, there is a, now this is going to be all numerical, so it's either going to, you know, it's either going to pan out or it's not. Um, there is a value function equation. Again, it's delay. So if you get lucky, you go from X to X plus R. Uh, you know, so, so this delta V quantifies the jump. There is a first derivative term. There's no Brownian motion here. Um, and there is a terminal condition because I put this on the finite, we put this on a finite time. Uh, for simplicity rather than the infinite time horizon. The coupling is through this uh, alpha bar, which is the, the integral of the alphas with respect to the m. And then the evolution equation is also, you know, kind of complicated because it also has jumps. So this is a forward equation. So the jumps, uh, you know, come with a minus here, come with a plus in the backward equation, but this is the Kolmogorov equation with the jumps. And can we say anything uh, numerically about this? And so that's uh, almost where I am. So here again is a, uh, you know, an algorithm that works for us. Guess, guess, guess the average quantity, guess the, you know, in this case, the alpha bar, solve the HAB, obtain the individual optimal control, solve the focke planck equation, get the mean field control. And then there is a trick, you know, sometimes these things are prone to oscillation and there is a, um, uh, there is a kind of, a, you know, a, a relaxation method of, so to speak, uh, that we found useful to average the, uh, you know, to construct the new alpha bar from the old alpha bar and uh, a weighted combination um, of the previous one. And this W we find, you know, changing the W smooths the solutions, but it doesn't, um, uh, doesn't have a big effect. And so here is a picture. Uh, here is a picture. So again, 
this is discussed more in Max's talk, but but the phenomenon here is so. Let me let me spend a little minute on this. I'm running out of time. So this Gaussian here is the initial distribution of wealth. Okay, cut off at zero, and what you see the colors as they become you know more skewed to the right. That's time moving forward according to this legend here at the top. And so what you see is that you have this Gaussian distribution, and as this cryptocurrency mean tool game evolves, you get a big tail, a bigger and bigger tail as time goes off on the large positive wealth. And you also get accumulation of people. There's nothing, there's nothing artificial about this number. They just seem to not uh, being very successful and they get stuck at wealth. Uh, they, st they stop trying and they obviously they don't succeed. So there's a kind of accumulation of people who are kind of stuck at this low wealth level. And so this is a phenomenon, and this is my last slide, uh, which quantifies preferential attachment or the rich get richer, which means that those who who initially started with more wealth um, are, uh, you know, are, are, are get richer. And, and uh, this is consistent, at least with empirical finding, for example, in this paper of Condor um, et al. And so, uh, you know, that is something that uh, we are uh, trying to go further with, but that's the sort of principal finding of this model of uh, cryptocurrency. There's some other things as well in the paper uh, that I can uh, refer you to. Okay, so I think I, my time is at 5.45. So let me, you know, what I say here is, is a summary of the things uh, that I probably said two or three times already. So I will just leave that there and try and escape. And I go back to the, go back to, to Birgit. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ronnie. It was a very interesting talk. So let's see what type of questions we have. We have one question from Mitesona. Um, he asked, does the integral differential operator cause difficulties in the numerical implementation? So relatedly, is there a guarantee that the iteration scheme converges? Uh, yeah, so not, no, we don't have that yet. So, so I mean, everything uh, that I demonstrated in terms of the numerics is, uh, is proof of concept that it it uh, it um, uh, it um, uh, seems to give reasonable solutions. It, it uh, you know there are some numerical uh, relaxation techniques that may one may have to use to 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 get it to converge. Um, but no, I mean I think we would have to sit down with a simplified system uh, and um, uh, you know and and um, see if we could prove something for that. But uh, no, at the moment, at least for this type of thing, no, we don't have it. Okay. So is there any other question? If there's a question from the audience, you can just type it into the Q&A. Okay, so at the moment there is no questions. So, I don't know, thank you very much, Ronnie. We will have some um, closing remarks actually by Thomas Hillen. So I just give the floor um, to Professor Hillen then. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Ronnie, for a nice talk. And thank you, Birgit, for leading the talk. I know it's very late for you. <laughs> You're probably ready for the bedtime. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah, let me just do some, some closing remarks. Um, so this annual meeting of Simon Kames was kind of a test to see if a big online conference can work. And I think it worked really, really well. And I'd like to thank all participants, all speakers, all plenaries, prize lecturers, and all session organizers. I also thank the wonderful Siam team who tirelessly arranged everything and put everything together and uh, virtual events for hosting the online version of the conference. Uh, many thanks to the organizational committee for finding topics and plenary speakers, in particular to my co-host, Lia Bronsard, who was instrumental at the beginning of the organization of the conference. I think we learned a lot about pros and cons of online meetings, and this knowledge will certainly inform organization of future events. The current times are strange. Uh, scientific insights are no longer hidden in obscure journals. They are dragged into the spotlight and freely interpreted and misinterpreted, and often used for political purpose. To me, it seems that our role as mathematicians and scientists is changing. For me, it is no longer enough to publish papers in specialized journals. I think the time is ripe for us to be seen and heard in the public. 
As experts in our areas, we are in a good position to share our insights. We can go to the internet, we can write blogs or write letters to newspapers, give interviews and participate in social media like Twitter and Facebook and the like. This is a huge space to present scientific rigor, to present scientific facts and to spark curiosity. I'm not talking about posting baby cat pictures or something, but I'm talking about posting, you're not preprint, maybe you're preprint on spiral waves or, or something. Enrich the online world with interesting facts, which are based on science. I personally feel that it is no longer sufficient for us to sit still. On this note of thought, uh, let me close the meeting. It was a great pleasure to work with Siam and to represent CAMES. Please consider to become a member of any of our societies. And have a great summer. Thank you very much.